Hey, hello everyone. Welcome back to the discussions. We took like a two week break. Um, I hope you had a great spring break. I hope you had fun and that you took a well-deserved rest from, from the projects. Um, before we start, how do you guys feel about your grades from uh, on exam one and project one? Are you guys happy, sad? Did you get what you expected? Less than what you expected? <laughs> Love the emoji reactions. <laughs> Was it hard? Well, I mean, was the exam hard? And were we harsh on grading the projects and the exams? Y'all are being quiet today. That's such a strange thing for this discussion. I thought the exam was was pretty good. It's pretty fair. I think the biggest thing was just making sure to read carefully and you know not skim over anything. A lot of small details that can make or break a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's usually especially with this class. This class is like that a lot. Um, but I, I'm I'm generally also a really bad test taker and I've noticed that when I took this class it was always just because I would like miss misread um misread a question for like just misread one word and and it really as you said it really does make or break the the solution so hopefully you guys are relatively satisfied with your grades. I hope that the discussions helped. We got some feedback in the like mid-semester survey and a lot of people were saying that discussions helped even though they're extra credit. So I'm semi-happy about that, I guess. I don't know how many of you guys responded, but um, but I hope the first exam is gonna help you with the final exam and that I can improve and, and get get you guys more prepared for the for the next one um on that note um i love your enthusiasm brody it always makes my day um on that note we're gonna start our discussion number nine and let's see what you guys can see of course you guys see the wrong screen as always um Swap. There we go. Um, so today's topics, topic topics are sets, maps, and hash tables. And I, the, yeah, we do say it's going to be sets, maps, and hash tables, but I'm mostly going to go over hashing, hash tables, and, um, and some sets. Um, as far as I'm aware, Professor Aman has not gone over hashing yet or has done so very briefly um, on, in, in his classes. So I'm going to focus on that today. And as, as always, we'll, we're going to have some menti problems, guys, so look forward to that. So hash tables, hash tables are a data structure in which um, every value that you want to store is basically mapped to, to buckets based on, on some keys. So it, it works essentially, um, if you think about it in terms of, of a C++ structure that I'm pretty sure you guys should have covered by now, which is a map, um, it's a hash tables are, are implemented using maps and you have the key which is essentially an index and then you have the values which are like the buckets where you store the data 
there is okay a hash function which is essentially used to compute the index at which you will store the data so you have a value you run it through the hash function and it will give you the um index location where you put the um the value or or the hashed value into the um to the buckets the the values obviously when you when you create a hash function i'm going to talk about uh Maurizio, i i think so i'm not i really don't know how in the background sql makes the tables i always just thought of sql like excel you know but um but maybe um possibly not sure i'll look it up if you want uh, and I'll get back to you on that one. Um, so <clears throat> when you're hashing the the strings, and no matter what kind of hash function you create, you'll always end up having some form of collision. A really good hash function will have very few collisions, but they still might happen. And because data is unpredictable. You cannot really account for everything that happens. So to solve that, we have um, these things called collision resolution policies. And there are several of them. You can implement whichever one you want, whichever one works for you. We're going to go over them and talk about their, um, their pros and cons, I guess. And hash tables are unordered um, data structures. So that means that if you're using a map to implement it, you will have to use an unordered map. The data within the hash table is not sorted in any way, um, other than obviously the way that the ha hash function makes the indices. But a lot of times you cannot really predict where the data is going to go just by looking at it if you have a complex enough hash function. Um, there's a note here that says that people often use hash map and hash table interchangeably, and it's going to happen. Um, the main difference is about like threading, I guess, and, and multi-thread um, environments where uh, hash maps can only have like one thread access the, or like one thread um, can 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 access or, or manipulate the hash map, whereas when you look at the hash tables, they're synchronized. So if you have several processes running on your computer and they they all want to access the hash table, they will all be able to do that as opposed to the hash map. So functions, hash functions. Um, a hash function is used to distribute the values um, or data across the hash table. And essentially they're represented as an array, but you can do it in many different ways. So we have three conditions for a hash function. It doesn't have to be a good hash function, but to be for a function to be a hash function, it has to have these three. And that is a hash function should be able to evenly distribute the data. So suppose that you have some sort of like, I don't know, uh, a, 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 let's see, a map and let's say that you have some keys here and you want to put your values in the buckets here a good hash function uh, or a hash function will distribute the data evenly so you won't have like a bunch of data just in on this key and having a bunch of collisions you'll have some data here and then here and so on uh, let's see let's clear that Clear that. There we go. Um, and the next condition is that it should be easy to compute, um, which means that you should be able to check it basically on pen and paper. And you should be able to compute it yourself if you need to um, check your logic. And then the last condition is that it should be deterministic, which means that it is not random, which means that if you run the same values through or, or the same um, 
key, I guess, through the function, it will always give you the same output. It will not just give random stuff that you cannot predict, that you cannot decode after you hash it. So you want to make sure that it's deterministic, that you can predict the values in a, in a way. Some common hash functions are basically uh, the key of the data, modulo the size of the table. So if you have a string, for example, that you want to put strings into the hash table, uh, a common hash function for that would be you take the length of the string and then you modulo, uh, you perform modulo of the table size on it. So let's say that you have a string, I don't know, top, it's, it has three um, letters and your table size is 10, you'll have something like three there because um, because three mod 10 is three. Uh, and then mid square hashing, string hashing, which is string hashing is really common in everyday practice where basically you just jumble the words. It's like, it's not jumbling it. It has obviously, it, it cannot be random, but it encodes it in a, in a using some algorithm that, that you choose. And then here's the example of the key module table size. So if you want to insert something like this, keys 462, 1093, 6491, and table size is 10, 462 will go at index 2 because that's the remainder when dividing by 10, which is modulo 10. 1093 is going to be 3, 6 is going to go to 6, and then 491 is going to go to index 1. Load factor. Load factor is another important thing for hash tables, and it is defined as the number of elements inside the hash table, so what you already inserted, and you divide that by the size of the array used for, um, for the keys, essentially. So let's say that you have, we have our hash table here, we have keys, and let's say that we have two, three buckets. That's what I want. I don't know how many this is. Six. Um, and we inserted three elements into it. N is going to be three, and K is going to be six. And once again, clear. Um, as the load factor grows, the hash table becomes slower. It's not that hash table becomes slower, it's that all the functions that you perform in the hash table become slower. So suppose that you want to insert and you have a, a relatively full table, you're going to have a lot of collisions and you're going to have to have separate functions to resolve those co collisions, which is going to slow the execution down. And if you want to access something, suppose that you have five elements that basically map onto the same key, you need to first hash the, the, the search term, find the index, and then find the exact term within, like, in the bucket of, of five terms on that index. So collisions slow down the operations. So you need to rehash things, and it's like, it's just it's a whole thing it's very slow so you want to make sure that as you're updating your hash table that you're also updating the load factor and um you do that by dynamically resizing the the array or map or whatever you want to call it that way you can maintain a set load factor so when the load factor hits the the set value or exceeds it, the complexity and average time of operations increases. So you want to, you know, decrease that and then you resize the array. So you can double it, you can do whatever you want, you can add one to it if you want, that's really slow, but just whatever works for you, whatever the requirement of the hash table that you're building are uh, or is. Um, just 
that you, you, you follow that and, and you unfortunately um, have to rehash all the keys, but it's, it, it, it improves the performance in long term much more than it like slows it down in this short term, um, short term way. And then you obviously restore the values in the new larger hash table to um, to maintain the low load factor. And you have examples. So suppose that you have 10 elements in an array and you want to keep the load factor or maintain it of 0 0.8, which means that this number of elements or number of values in the hash table divided by the size of the, the array is 0 0.8. Um, if we have 10 elements or the size of the array is 10 and we have the load factor of 0.8, we can increase the size of the array and rehash all the keys when we insert the eighth element. This is a little, the phrasing on this one is a little strange. So is this clear for now before I move on to the next example? Just quick thumbs up would be great and appreciated. So I don't waste too much time. Thumbs up, thank you. <laughs> so a real world um, example, the default, um, load factor for hash maps in Java is 0.75. So at any um, stage, the array can only be 75% full, which um, this is usually like this between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. It's usually where, where the load factor is in, in practice. And it, it, I think it was like some research was done on it, but it, it proved to be a good trade off between like, time and then space costs and like rehashing everything and how long that takes and, and filling it up. So those are those are pretty common factors. And now we have Menti. And I'm gonna go to Menti and start it before. Is your Menti code? Do you guys want Okay, do you guys want me to type the code in the chat? Do you think that would be useful? There, I did it anyway. Uh, let's share. Menti. Now you guys should be able to see Menti. Okay, and I am going to start the quiz. So the first question is, what is the, why is this, oh my God, sorry, I need to stop this. No, why is this the first question? This is not the first question. I'm so sorry, guys. My laptop broke like two weeks ago and now I'm operating on a really, really slow, really, really old um, laptop that I borrowed. And it has been messing with me. Hence why I couldn't hold office hours for you guys before. Um, if only it, I think it crashed on me guys, I think. I hate this so much. Now this is gonna make me have to edit more in stupid YouTube editor is going to slow down uploading the video. I am, let's pretend this didn't happen. Um, 
start over again. Same code, as I promise. Now, now, we're, we, we're good. Now we should be good, hopefully. I'm really sorry about that. Technology. Okay. Which of these is not a condition for a hash function? So the options you have are the hash function is able to evenly distribute the data. The hash function is easy to compute. The hash function is deterministic. And the hash function should resolve all collisions. Good job, guys. That was great. Great job. Next one. If a hash function is implemented as string size mod 10, what is the index where the key potato will be stored in the hash table? Oh, even better. Doing great this discussion. Next question. If we want to maintain a load factor of 0.5 and have an array of current capacity 20, when do we increase the capacity of the array? So current size is 20. K is 20. Load factor is 0.5. Nice. Great job. So we hit um, 10 elements in the array. 10 divided by 20 is 0.5. We have reached the load factor of 0.5, so we increase the size of the array. And the leaderboard for now is... Oh, wow. Oh, it's Sai again. Wow. Good job, Sai. You like you slipped up on that discussion before the exam, but you're coming back um, to take the title once again. And now I'm going to go back to the presentation. Yes, OK. Moving on. Do you have any questions at this point? Any questions, no questions? Are we good? Gucci, thumbs up again, thumbs down. I, a heart works, I guess. Moving on. I'm gonna take what I can get. So, collision resolution. Um, when inserting an element, it's, as I said, it's possible to have a hash function that just creates the same index um, as as for some other string, which means that at that point the index will be occupied and that is called a collision. So if you have the key mod 10 function and you're trying to insert 462 and 92 into the table, they'll both give um, they'll both give index two. So it's up to you to figure not figure out but pick how you want to handle the collisions. The examples are you just don't allow duplicate um, or, or keys that have the collisions or same index. But as the slides say, that is kind of rude. You know, you want to allow for versatility in your, um, in, in your data. Um, and then the other approach is obviously to allow the keys that have uh, collisions. Um, in which case, you can do something called open addressing, separate chaining, and or that's it that we give you right now. But let's just move on to open addressing. So in open addressing, um, all entry records are stored in the array itself. So you just have a single array, and and you put it, uh, you put the values at the 
just set the indices. When you uh, when you perform an operation like you you do the hash function and it gives you a collision, you essentially just keep rehashing it. So you just keep running it through the through the um, through the hash function until you get the next open slot. Um, and you keep performing the operations. Um, you can do it in different ways. The first one is linear probing, which is basically if you have, if you look at this example, and linear probing is you keep moving on until you get to the first empty spot. So you, try to insert 52 with a mod 10 um, function, index 2 is occupied, you move on to 3, index 3 is occupied, you move on to 4, index 4 is occupied, 5 is occupied, and then you go to 6, and then you would insert it here. And that's called linear probing. So you go linearly, test every single index after the one that's computed until you see the next um, open slot. And then we have an example, already tall talked about that quadratic probing is that you keep in you keep increasing the um, interval between like checking where to add it so this this gets rid of um, clusters which I'm pretty sure we talk about but for example if you want to try and add 52 at um, for, uh, position 2 at index 2 it's occupied you try at 3 3 is occupied you try at two more five and then you try four spaces ahead and so on and you just keep incrementing the like the the interval between the the indices that you try and quadratic has is most common at this point so this helps remove the clusters which i'm going to talk about later um essentially just having all the data in one spot and and allows the data to be spread out so example of linear probing, if we want to insert the following values, so Aman, Matt, Robin, Antonio, Andrew, Sarah, Julia, Mai, uh, into the array using the hash function string size mod array size, and the array size is 10. Um, we also want to maintain the factor of 0.7. So current load factor is 0 divided by 10, so it's 0, and we're good. We want to insert Aman. A man's length is four, so we insert a man at index four. And then we have Matt, and Matt length is three, three mod ten is three, so we insert at index three. And we have Robin, Robin has length five, we put Robin at index five, and then we keep going, Antonio seven, Andrew six. And then Sarah, Sarah unfortunately has the um, um, length four, which four mod 10 is four, but index four is already occupied. So with linear probing, we check index five, occupied index six, occupied index seven, occupied. And then we get to index eight and that one's available. So Sarah gets added there. And now we have another set of mentee questions. Since we're on a roll with these and with this problem, I'm just going to keep going and ask you about inserting into this specific array. Let's see, can you guys see the, yes, you can. Menti has the same code, by the way. Um, and Let's see. So Julia gets inserted at what index, assuming that linear probing is used. So we're keeping the same problem as before, the same table. We're trying to insert Julia. Yeah, good job. So Julia is has length five. It'll, we'll try to add it 
to index five, but that's occupied and we keep moving on until we hit the um, next, next first available index. Next question. After Julia is inserted, does the resizing happen? So we inserted Julia at index nine. Do we resize the table? And this table is before inserting Julia, so you have to account for adding Julia into the table before you make the decision. Yes, so you we do resize the um the array because at this point we have seven um strings in the array, and that makes the load factor of 0.7. So we resize it, and in this case, we doubled it. Next question is, now we want to insert a my, what index will he be inserted at? And that is after resizing the table, so we double the size. Sarah, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Sarah. Yeah. Um, does the resizing only happen? Does it so it only happens when the when we reach max capacity of the array, or does it happen automatically when the that the load factor is above zero point five? I guess. Um, for this problem, we had the load factor of zero point seven, but oh, okay. uh, it depends on what you implement as as a developer. Usually, you wanna the moment you hit the load factor that you specified. Um, you want to resize the table in any way that you want, so you can like double it. You can do increase the size of it four times, etc. Gotcha. So Thank you. Yep. So y'all did great on this question, and we have the leaderboard again, which means I get to go back to slide. Oh, Chase, good job on taking the first spot. And now we're going to go back to slides. Do you have any other questions at this point before I move on? Because we're going to sets now. Just as a reminder, um, Professor Aman will talk about this more in classes about hashing. It's just a quick introduction before he does it. So linear probing, as I mentioned, it is problematic because we suffer from clustering. So if you look at the example that we had, right now, all the values are in this like cluster here on indices three to, to 10. They're all here. And if you wanna like search it, you have to, it's 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 kind of it's weird. You have to like you have this giant like blob of values, and a lot of them have the hash value of four when you're indexing them. But then you have to go and linearly check them and see is the 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 one at is the value at the index that you computed the actual value that you're looking for. So it's not really <clears throat> not really practical. Um, and in that case, we can solve that with quadratic probing. So instead of inserting at the first next element, we check the first one and then two away and then four away and so on and so on. Quadratic probing, this is, I already talked about this. So this is like, it's open addressing where we'll look for the I squared slot in the ith iteration of the given hash value. This is a complex um, sentence. It's really not that bad. So you want to add a string at some index um, in the array, but that slot is full. We try index plus one, if that's, or index plus one mod size of the array. 
that one's occupied, we try index plus two squared mod s, and then if that's occupied, you go three squared and so on and so on. Um, and then this process is repeated until all of the, um, until you find the first empty slot. The good thing about having the mod s here is that suppose that your i gets really large and you go, like it, it goes above the size of the array after you square it, it will loop back around. So you'll, you'll start looping back and starting from the start of the array, like looking at the start of the array again until you find the right um, location. And there is, there is another conflict resolution policy that's, or collision resolution policy that's called separate chaining, which is essentially you do not put values at a different index. If the value that you're trying to add computes to an index zero, you add it at the um, index zero. If another value computes to the index zero, you add it at index zero, but you link it in a linked list form of um, uh, structure essentially. And it's called separate chaining. So we essentially chain all the elements that are at the same index together. And we have these mini link lists at each um, index. Um, it, each, each bucket, so each location is, is independent and has a list of entries with the same index. Um, hashing the elements is essentially um, the time taken, the time to take the hash, uh, yeah, the time to ta the hash the elements is essentially the time taken to find the bucket and then time for the like operation of either inserting, look, looking up, removing, whatever you want to do. So in separate chaining, um, the hash function is still string size mod array size, and we want to insert these values. If you want to insert aman, we insert, we chain string aman at index four. Then we have Matt at three. Then we have Robin at five, Antonio at seven, Andrew at six. And then Sarah is once again at index four. So we just link it after string aman to, um, to form this little like link list for for the chain. And then we have Julia, which computes index five. <laughs> oh no, Chase, that's so sad. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, Julia computes to index five. We just chain it onto the um, list at index five and so on and so on. So this is a little function about, um, or of the performance. Um, it's, it, it maps average misses per lookup and the load factor and, and how it like, how it contributes, how these two depend on each other essentially. And then time complexities for hash maps, insertion in best case O of one, in average case O of one, and in worst case O of n. So Best case means that the index is empty, the hash function is computed in O of one time, and you don't need to do any rehashing, you don't need to do any linear probing, you don't need to do any um, chaining essentially. Average case has the same thing, you don't have to do any collisions essentially, you just insert the element. And then O of n is that suppose that you, that all the elements you want to insert hash to the same index. No matter what kind of collision resolution policy you have, you'll still have to essentially run through all of those n elements because you'll keep performing the same thing. So if you do linear probing and you want to insert the nth element, you'll have to run through the n, n minus one elements in, um, in a row to get to the, the empty index. If you have quadratic probing, once again, you have the same thing because they all map to the same index. Um, if you have the chaining, you still have to run through the entire chain to add the value at the end. So it's going to be O of n. Deletion, 
same thing, same reasoning, search, same thing, same reasoning, except with search, if you want to, if you're looking for a specific value, you still have to run through all of them to make sure that you get the right one. Um, we will not test you or quiz you on the like buffered um, complexity, but all operations in um, a hash map would be O of one if we have it amortized. Amortized, amortized, that's the word. Um, it's essentially, what that means is that the really, really bad case of time complexity happens very, very rarely. And the relatively average behavior happens most of the time. So moving on, C++ map versus uh, unordered map. So in C++, we have two types of maps. You have map maps and unordered maps. Um, both of them have a key and value. Um, the difference is that maps, uh, maps are ordered, the keys are ordered, and in unordered maps, the, the keys are not ordered automatically. So maps are implements, implemented using red-black trees in C++. Keys are inherently sorted. So it's, make sure that you like, you're aware that keys are sorted and not the values. So if you want to iterate through a sorted, through a map, it will iterate in the sorted key um, order, but the values, they might be jumbled around because it really depends on what you, you put as a value. And you can call a map a tree map. I don't really, it's not really common. Um, all fundamental operations are log n because it's sorted. And Java's tree map is the same thing. And then we have unordered maps or hash maps. Um, they're used, they're implemented using dynamic arrays with hash functions built in. The time complexity, well, the average time complexity is all of one as, if, as we've seen before. And now I have to ask you if you have any questions for me, because I've been asking you questions so far. Real quick before I open the quiz for you guys. Uh, okay, so Brody has a question. Do we have to understand the tree implementation of ordered maps? No, not necessarily. You know um, what your project three is going to be at this point? Um, if you want to implement a map in your project three, you will have to do it quite literally using the trees. Like you'll have to do, you'll have to know the, the tree implementation. But if you don't want to do that, and for the rest of the class, you don't have to know anything other than the fact that they're, um, that the, the implementation is, is done through red black trees. That's the only thing that we require you to do. Any other questions? If not, I'm gonna do a little sh quick share for you guys to see the quiz. Let's see. 